I'm really hoping, because I tend to get a mix when I do these talks, I either get really hardcore accessibility advocates and they're really into it, or I get people who have no idea what the heck accessibility is all about and what it even means. And if that's the case, and if you're in either of those camps, you are in the right place. Thank you for, thank you for coming here. If you are sort of, kind of not even sure what the heck you're, you're, uh, what, what accessibility is, but you want to learn more, you're, again, in the right place. If you deal with software at all and want to make software that people can use effectively and that people can enjoy using effectively with a user experience that they will want to come back to, you are in the right place. If you deal with software at all in any way, shape, or form and wish that it was better than what it oftentimes turns out to be, you are in the right place. Um, having some flicker going back and forth with the slides, I apologize for that. It's just the nature of the connection. We're going to work with it the best we can. Benefit is here, though. I can always look over the shoulder and see what we're talking about. So I want to start with what uh, accessibility and inclusive design actually mean. And they are compatible, but they are not necessarily interchangeable terms. When we talk about accessibility, that is being able to make information or services available to those who otherwise would not have the ability to get that to get that experience or that service. When you deal with a, for example, when you are talking about a disability like uh, lack of movement, and you have a ramp so that you can go up a set of stairs, that is in its purest form accessibility. But it is also inclusive design because guess what? Even somebody who doesn't need to use a wheelchair can use the ramp and the experience is still good for them. There are examples for accessibility where you have to go up a steep incline and a ramp becomes this really horribly zigzaggy thing that goes for days that nobody can really use. So yes, it's accessible, but its design sucks. And that's never any fun. Inclusive design is the design of mainstream products and or services that are accessible to and usable by as many people as reasonably possible without the need for special adaptation or specialized design. That's the one I want to make sure you understand. When we're talking about inclusive design, and I really want to make the emphasis that I'm, I'm going to be leaning more on that latter part of this talk than on the former. Because if we do the work to do inclusive design, we lessen the need for that last mile of accessibility. And then the work we do for that last bit is actually easier. So why should we care about this? Well, basically, nearly one in five people has some form of disability. If you live long enough, guess what? You will be one of them at some point. Every single one of us. I received a neat little present for my 45th birthday. Um, and this is kind of normal. Some people get it earlier, some people get it a little later, but generally speaking, 45 is the year that you get the gift that keeps on giving. It is where your eyeballs harden. And it is where your depth of field starts to become fixed. And that squinting to be able to see things that you used to be able to do much easier stopped working. And you get a pair of readers like I wear. Now, I'm one of those people that went through dozens of pairs and crushing them because when, you, when I wear regular readers, I can't see you out there. It makes my head hurt. So I'm constantly doing this and moving my glasses all over the place and losing them all the time. I finally trained myself to get a pair of progressives so I have planos on top and my prescription and my need at the bottom. And it took me a while to get used to that weird fuzzy line in the middle, but I, I'm now over it. And so 90% of the time, I just wear them. And it was interesting going through this because I realized that my having to use my reading glasses and or take them off when it's not comfortable having to shift back and forth, it introduced me to a problem in the sense that being disabled, being disabled is a phrase that we should not be throwing around because it is a final verdict, basically. You know, you are disabled. You know, it just, it's, it speaks in totality. I prefer saying, I have a disability. Even if the disability is a situational one. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a bit. But 
primary disability is where you have a persistent issue. If I were to say have low vision all the time, like regardless of wearing my glasses, I had low vision, that would be considered a primary disability. If somebody has cerebral palsy and they have limited movement, they have a primary disability. But there are also situational disabilities because I can switch between distance vision, but I have to put on my glasses for close vision. I have a situational disability. Sometimes I need it, sometimes I don't. If you're in a rock concert and you get a phone call, are you gonna be able to take that call? Probably not, right? Guess what? You've joined the ranks of the situationally disabled, at least for that little bit of time. So situational disabilities, examples, background noise. Distracted tasking. If somebody is trying to get you to do six or seven things at the same time, good luck trying to read a web page full of statistical information and hoping to remember it and make sense of it. Small text, non-scaled web pages. Hey, anybody like to go to like do they type in a web page on their site and all of a sudden it's that's it's it's not been optimized, there's no responsive design to it, and you have to blow up the site like multiple times just to actually read what's there. Come on, show of hands. Who's annoyed by it? Good, everybody should be. If you're not annoyed by it, you either got really great vision or just nothing perturbs you. And I want to party with you. Um, and simple, the one, the, one that, uh, the one that freaked me out the most and really made it clear for me was uh, when, I, um, when, I landed in, um, when I landed in Istanbul and I got off a plane and at the one section I was in the airport and there wasn't a single sign in English. And I, and I had to hunt down Excuse me, does somebody speak English here so that I can figure out where I need to go? That was very humbling because I'm used to, you know, hey, English is spoken everywhere, right? Well, guess what? In certain places, no, it's not. And you are now verbally disabled, even if it's just temporarily, but it's enough to really make you stop again. So I'm going to show you an example of inclusive design that might get some quizzical looks and might get some horrified reactions from people. Let's see, who can tell me exactly what this is? It's an IKEA instruction sheet, right? How many of us have gone through the frustration and annoyance of, I, I'm seeing hands go, oh yeah, I'll admit it, I hate those things, they're awful, they're terrible. But you know what? I beg to differ. IKEA has actually put together to the best of their ability, they get better over time. I've seen some from 10 years ago that were really, really terrifying. They've gotten a lot better with this. But this is an example of inclusive design in action. Who can tell me why? Yeah, there's no need for language or very little need for language. In a couple of places we have numerals. That's it. That gives you an order of operations if this had to spell out every step in words, you would need to print 16 versions of this, or 30 versions of it, or however many, and that would just be incredibly expensive, just in paper printing costs, and your little flat pack would have a booklet that would be that thick, and you'd end up throwing it away. By making it this way, they can do it in one page. Almost everybody can go from one to the final steps and get their finished product. Yeah, frustratingly, putting the screws in and crookedly, that we really can't fix just yet. But instruction-wise, this is brilliant. And this is something that, when you think about how can we incorporate inclusive design into our ideas, I'm not saying become IKEA, but think with that as your end goal. So in 2007, Gary Siddick wrote a book called uh, How to Design Web Accessible Sites, and he made 10 principles of accessibility. If you are a developer, if you are a tester, if you are a product owner, and you want to get into the mindset of thinking accessible, thinking inclusive, these 10 principles are them. I'm gonna go through them quickly, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of an example of how to think about them when, we, when I show the example. Number one, avoid making assumptions about the abilities of your users. Your technologies can send and receive text. Do not assume anything beyond that, period. Time and technology belongs to your users, not to us who develop the products. Never take control of either without a really good reason. Provide good text alternatives for any non-text content. Pictures, please. 
Go in, seriously, if you've got your computer open, take a web page, for example, and just turn off images. What do you see? Probably a big question mark in most sites. If you're lucky, you've got a site who actually put some alt text in there. And if you're really lucky, you found somebody who understands accessibility and has put alt text in that actually describes what the picture really is. But that's very rare. Use widely available technologies to reach your audience. Yes, JAWS is a really neat screen reader, but if you optimize for its controls and you can't use it with other screen readers, you're still locking people out. Use clear language to communicate your message. I will harp on this multiple times. If anybody here does any writing, even your test plans, even your content for your website, aim for a sixth grade reading level. Even if you have a technical site, aim for a sixth grade level. And use space. Walk stuff out. Your readers will thank you, even if they don't deal with things like dyslexia or low attention span. Make your sites usable, searchable, and navigable. And use a tab order, please. Design your content for semantic meaning and maintain separation between content and presentation. That means please do your level best to keep the div tag in your pages to an absolute minimum. If they're representing a header, call it that. If they're representing a footer, call it that. If it's a sidebar, if it's a widget, name it. Make it something so that if somebody is actually going through with the screen reader, they can make sense of what's on the page. Div after div after div after div ends up being meaningless, and it can't be parsed. Progressively enhance your basic content by adding extra features. This means do not do accessibility all in one shot. Increment it. Start slow. Do a little bit at a time. Get your users used to the idea that this is how it's going to be developed. Add things as you go. Don't try to say, we're going to shove 50 accessibility stories into a release and it's all going to go out at the same time because you're going to get the worst of both worlds, which is going to be that you're going to have accessibility users who aren't going to make sense of what's happening because the things that they've adapted to don't work anymore. And your regular users are going to go, what the heck did you do to our site? More on that later, you don't have to have that outcome by the way. And 10, as you encounter new web technologies, apply these same principles when making them accessible. So I'm gonna take an example from my own product. If I'm going to harp on the accessibility bandwagon, I am going to put myself up for the firing squad first. This is part of social text. Social text makes a product that incorporates uh, wiki, blogging, signaling. Basically, if you think about all taking Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Wikipedia, but putting it behind a firewall and taking out all the advertising, that's kind of what social text is. It's a productivity platform. And one of the things that we decided, because of the fact that we deal with a lot of wiki pages and a lot of workspaces and a lot of views, we thought it would be really cool for us to create a new content link. And in the process of creating that content link, we're going to create a, um, a sub dropdown. So you click some content and it opens up and you get three sections you can look at. Workspaces, recently viewed, and watch lists. Plus, you get to also create new content. Now, if you are a mouse user or if you are a finger touch user, this makes all the sense in the world. It's perfectly natural. It flows smoothly. If you happen to be a keyboard only user or because of using a screen reader or other technologies, you have to be a keyboard only user, this is a absolutely suck implementation. And it was problematic when we put it together. That sounds a little harsh, but I mean, it was difficult because if you're just going through and you're trying to tab in, how do you tab to that middle window there? If you haven't actually put together an ARIA tag or something in there to actually say, hey, if you press space, shift, enter, you can shift between these tabs. If you don't do it, what's your default? You hit tab forever and hope that the next tab order takes you over to the next one. And then, oh wait, I listened to something that was in the last tab order. How do I get back there? Do I do a shift, alt, you know, shift tab? Can I get back? Oh, passed it again. Wait, it was miserable. So in the process, we, I went back and I used those principles and said, what can we use here? How can we define this? 
how can we make this make sense? And through tab ordering, basically you hit the content thing and the window drops down, the first thing it goes to is create new content. Because we're hoping that's the first thing you want to do if you're going there. If you don't, you hit shift tab, that brings you down into the subspace, and then we give text in it that describes, hey, you're in the workspaces tab. By the way, the workspaces tab has 40 items in it. Well, okay. Not the best solution in the universe, but a pretty good one. At least now we know we're in the subdirectory. We know we've got 40 listings. And so if I want to, I can use any number of tab orders to jump 10 forward or jump 20 forward. But now I know. And if I jump 20 forward and I go, okay, nope, that's past letter T. I need to go backwards. And now I can go back five or go back two or go back one. Believe it or not, if you get somebody who's a really good keyboard user, they're really fast at that. And they can figure it out quickly. And that's their preferred method. Shift over and you can get to the other watch list. And then if you just hit escape key, you get out of the content and you can it. Easy to say, hard to implement. And it took some time and it took some tears and it took some gnashing of teeth and going back and forth with the developer to make it work. But we did. So, I want to give you a heuristic. And each of you can use this heuristic anytime you do any testing, but especially if you're doing accessibility or want to talk about inclusive design. And I wish I could claim this heuristic as mine. It's not. It was actually developed by a co, by a colleague of mine. We've done a number of accessibility topics together. In some ways, we joke that he's the uh, he's the the the, the mild mannered mad scientist who's afraid of speaking, and I'm the public face that comes out and like can shout to the world about this stuff. And so this 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 mnemonic, be humble, is courtesy of Albert Gureyev. And uh, it wouldn't exist without his work and his tireless efforts to put it together. So number one, humanize. Understand the emotional components of what you're working on. Actually put yourself in the shoes of your users. This is why I say don't automatically jump to, oh, if we put way aria tags inside of our pages. We're accessible. No, you're not. You're meeting a checklist requirement for accessibility. But if you have not actually taken the time to really see this through the eyes of your users, you're probably not. And you could be way missing one. Unlearn. So you may have to, if you're, a, if you're an active mouse user, unplug your mouse or do something to disable your trackpad so you have to use your keyboard. So that you have to develop some new muscles. It's going to be uncomfortable, I promise. Uh, if you really want to go for broke, turn on voiceover. Who here has their MacBook? Who has a, a Mac? Just give us a quick one. Okay. Could you do me a favor? Could you turn on voiceover? Do you know how to do that? All right. Go, go to your system settings and click on the accessibility option. Yeah. There should be accessibility. So you click on that. There should be something in there that says voiceover. It might be like in the middle of the listing. Yeah. Sure. Click on voiceover and usually it's going to be just enable voiceover. And if you click on the other voiceover, turn up your volume. Use voiceover, and turn up your volume. Alright. Pick your favorite web page. Sure. Now just start hitting tab and see if you can make sense of it. And close your eyes while you're at it. Are you feeling it? Everybody in the room, except the exception of this poor man here who's had to close his eyes and try to make sense of what's on that page, could you? No, right? Now imagine that, 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 you, that you have no choice but to interact with this tool. How would that make you feel? Very. <laughs> but it would also make you so steam that you would say, there's got to be a way to do this better. And what can we do? And that's where you go back to those 10 principles, and that's where you go back to the patterns. And you start to use those to be able to say, hey, we can do this better. There's technology that allows us to do this better. Come on. It's the right thing to do. And you're going to find yourself saying that a whole lot. It's the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do. I prefer using that 
rather than saying, why should we care about accessibility? Well, because if you don't, you're going to lose a lot of money and you're going to get sued. I hate having accessibility conversations with that as the primary discussion point. Because it tones it in a negative. We're doing this because we don't want to lose something. Not a real good motivating place to start, right? You with me? But instead, no, we want to do this because we want to be able to allow the maximum number of users to use our products, to be effective. We want to be able to sell to everybody. Because the more people that can use our product painlessly, they'll come to us because we are a differentiator. Why would I use this? Oh, hey, I, my, my brother uses a screen reader and he really wants to use this product because you actually pay attention to that. That's great. So more money for everybody. Yay. That's a much better position to be able to have this conversation from. Why do accessibility? Not because you don't want to get sued, because it's the right thing to do. Repeat that for me. Why do accessibility? You all need some caffeine desperately. All right, I'm sorry, let's move on with this. Model, as I just said, use personas to help you see, hear, and feel the issues. By having you close your eyes, I just did that for you. It's a small example of it. You can make it much more intense if you want to. One of the ways I do it is I turn off my screen, and if I really want to do it, I'll walk into a closet where I know there's no light in, and I'll close it so that even with my eyes open, even if I strain the hardest I can, I can't see my keyboard. I can't see my screen. The only interaction I have is with the screen reader. And you develop that empathy really fast, and you start to really feel the frustrations. Bill, learn, learn the testing heuristics, learn skills, testing infrastructure. Develop credibility on this topic. If you start coming in and you start communicating, saying that, hey, I've gone through this. I've done the pain. I've wrapped my hands in duct tape and tucked my arms in duct tape to simulate what it would be like with severely limited mobility. And let me tell you how much this site sucks because of it. You're going to develop some serious credibility if you're willing to do that. And even if you don't want to go that far, by developing credible personas and really populating them, really making them so that they are fleshed out, full, genuine people that other people can understand and empathize with, you're going to go a long way in being able to explain this and being able to champion it. Learn. What are the barriers to using your product? How do users perceive it? How do they understand it? How do they operate it? And how is it different? Even when we use personas, even when we try to put this stuff together, I cannot simulate beyond the most superficial level what a non-sighted user goes through. Why? Because after I'm tired of this simulation, I can take it off and go back to my reality. They can't. So I never fully understand what they're feeling, but I can get close. Best thing I can do, of course, is to really communicate with those who have to rely on these 100% of the time and get their perspective even better. Have them help us test. Experiment. Put yourself in literal situations. Collaborate with designers and programmers. Provide feedback. And once you start doing these literal situations, you're going to be more than willing to provide feedback. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about a few tools that you can use. And I'm tr I've tried to make this talk as tool agnostic as possible. There are some that are just very, very helpful. And I think that every, anybody who does anything with accessibility should learn how to use them. And so the very first one that almost everybody goes to automatically is WAVE. WebAIM.WAVE.COM. Uh, in the paper, I've got this listed in our references. It's a simple site. You basically punch in your URL, and it will give you a We'll give you some tags and explain, yeah, this is good. Yep, this is possibly a problem or at least a warning. That's an error. And you can, you can actually go through and you can see a breakdown of what the actual errors are and what you can do about them. If you prefer the Chrome developer tools approach because you want to be able to get into the console and actually experiment with them and see what the messages they come out with, there are a variety of developer tools that are available. One of my favorite is Axe. And Axe will allow you to go in and actually do a sweep and see, hey, is everything lined up right? What are the problems? What are the errors that I'm seeing? And you can, of course, go into your console, change that item, reload the page, and see what happens. So you can actually check out your evaluation in real time. 
Screen readers. We just had an experience with it. If you've not had a chance to play with a screen reader, if you've got a Mac, it's built in. If you have a PC, you can get a free choice. NVDA is a free screen reader that you can download. And if you've got a spare thousand bucks, you can download the industry standard, which is JAWS. And uh, JAWS has a lot of features that go above and beyond the basic uh, screen readers. I strongly, strongly recommend that you don't overuse those. Because if you make your product so that it's optimized for JAWS, you are basically making it so that anybody who uses an open source screen reader, if they're not using the most basic of, of tools, they're not going to be able to use it. Or at least make an alternative so that the open source screen readers can be used. Color contrast. So 8% of men, generally speaking, a much smaller percentage of women, but there are out there, suffer from some form of color blindness. And that, the most typical one is where reds and blues kind of blend together. But there are other variations where greens don't quite register or yellows don't quite register. And if you have a screen that is all nice and pastel and kind of blends all nice and neat for a normative user, those are great. But if you are a colorblind user, literal text will disappear into the background. So this is an example. This is a color contrast analyzer. And currently, it is set for level A8 of of WCAG's evaluation, which is 3 to 1. So even at 3 to 1, there's actual text here that because... That, so if you cannot physically read the text here, that means that the contrast is too low for you to read it. And this is our, this is our default template for our product. And it, it did not pass level AA minimum you know, medium uh, contrast of three, of three to one. We fixed that, and now it does. But this is an example where you can see real quick, just right in front of you, okay, dang, that's problematic. And you can show this to your developers and just say, look, we're not even matching a medium level here. We're certainly not gonna match the top level. What do you wanna do about this? And they might say, it's okay, or hmm, let's fix that. And again, color contrast is not that difficult to fix. Cognitive analysis. This is probably one of my favorite tools. And it's used primarily to help people do grammar edits, and it's used to do just writing analysis. But Hemingway is a fantastic tool if you are dealing with cognitive disabilities such as ADD, dyslexia, and others where reading a lot of text is just tiring and they just, they struggle with it. My recommendation again, what do I, what do I recommend you game for? Grade six, use space, block things out. And even here, the nice thing is, is that if you're writing something out and you say, hey, you know what, this phrase, as a simple alternative, or one of these sentences is really genuinely hard to read. And other options that you can use to help make your writing stronger. It'll help make you make you more grammatically correct in your writing in general, but this is a neat hidden gem for working with cognitive You want to be able to see how sites behave right next to each other. The web, the web Accessibility Initiative, W3C, has a before and after demonstration. So you can actually look at this. So it's a whole site that's laid out. And depending upon what you select, you can select each page. You can view them, A, B them in real time. And look, what happens? You know, what, what does the accessible page look like? What does the inaccessible page look like? Open up the actual source code and you can see what changes have been made. Put them right next to each other and see. Usually the changes are not dramatic. They're adding alt tags. They're structuring the elements so that they can be called out. And when you see them side by side, yeah, there's some little differences. Like the buttons might just be shaded a little differently, or the text might be worded in a different rendered in a different manner, not worded, rendered in a different manner. But generally you'll go, oh, that's not that radically different. It doesn't 
I thought it was going to take all my eye candy and throw it out the window. Usually it doesn't. What it really does is it gives you more options or you allow for more options based on the system or on the usage of the person or some other details if accessibility options are turned on. By default, it will allow you to access certain things. So the next thing is going to be kind of rapid fire, and this is thinking inclusively. So we want to ensure that images are described with alt tags and that the picture is described meaningfully. So if you say, picture of a car, it's better than nothing, but it's almost useless. Picture of a 1944 Mustang on Hermosa Beach during sunset. That's a whole lot better. That actually describes what the picture is, and if you're reading an article about that, like some hot rod show that's happening down at Most Beach, okay, you get the pictures in context, and you can sort of image what it is in your mind. Provide a skip link at the top of the document. If you have a really elaborate navigation bar, and people just want to get to the point of what's on your page, the very first link that you should have past the browser's URL Tab order number one should be press this link to skip to main content. It will totally bypass all of your nav, and whatever is in that main window, it will start on that first word and it will go. Use the language attributes and tags, both inside of your pages and at the top document level. This is great for if people want to actually translate your page, but it's also helpful if, if you're putting in words or terminology that you know, you just want to, maybe you just want to include a passage that's in a language that doesn't use a Roman alphabet or that uses a language that people aren't familiar with. By using the language tag, if they want to translate that to see what it actually says, they can do so. And you don't necessarily have to, every single time you want to put that in, say, oh, by the way, this is what it sounds like in English. Oh, and by the way, this is what it is in French. So you don't have this big stack. You just put the language tag in and say, if you would like, press this button and it will translate for you. Big plus. Make buttons that are scalable. Please don't make buttons that are images. It's awful. Because when buttons are images, if you have to actually expand it, pixels blow out. And text blows out. And you don't know what you're looking at. By making them scalable, as they grow and, and shrink, they're in size and they're represented in a way that you can easily understand. Use images with universal meaning, or as universal as you possibly can. Again. Let's go back to the Ikea example. You see, if you see the person in the Ikea with a stern looking face, that's a good bet that you probably don't want to do that. You see the big happy face, it's a good bet you do want to do that. Smileys are kind of universal. As so far as I've been able to tell, a smiley does not mean negative and a frowny face does not mean positive in any culture that I've yet studied. If somebody has, a, if somebody has an example that doesn't measure up to that, talk to me afterwards. I'd love to hear about it. Make your content available in a variety of formats. I record a podcast called The Testing Show. Shameless plug. My podcast gets published as an audio file. Not everybody can hear my podcast. So I provide a full transcript of my podcast on the Qualitest testing site. So for every podcast that we do, we generate a full transcript, which means you don't even have to download the podcast to actually hear the podcast. You can read it. If you have a video format, same thing, but you would probably want to add closed captioning so they can actually follow along with the video. The nice thing is, is that YouTube's gotten pretty good at that in the sense that many of their, of their content is already closed captioned, well done. But if you're providing content and you want to be closed captioned, yeah, you gotta do the work. You gotta actually put in the closed captions for them to do it or somehow subscribe to a service that will do it for you. Allow multiple ways to enter the date. This one's a real big pet peeve of mine. You ever get to something where it's like, hey, I need to schedule something, okay, and you get this calendar module that you then have to bounce around, or you don't have an option to actually select the year, you have to tab all the way through 12 plus times to get to another year, and then 12 plus times and do something. If you're scheduling something two years out in advance, you're just hitting this button over and over again. Give them a text box. Month, date, year, done. If you want to play with the little buttons and click it around, that's great. But give them more options. Allow Pinch to Zoom to let users to determine how much zoom and focus they need. Make touch areas large enough to interact with without requiring you to rescale. 
How many of you enjoy the process of going, oh, I need to enter in a username and a password? Hang on. It, oh, too much, too much. Uh, no, I type in it. No, I'm losing it. You get, you're constantly having that battle. Suck you, X. It's really not fun. Make, okay, encourage the use of proportional fonts. Don't scale your fonts exactly. Make sure that they can grow based on a percentage. Because then they scale in the way that you want your page to look, and you're not just tying them so that if somebody wants to blow it up, then everything is blown out of proportion and it doesn't make sense at the moment. Write simply and use space when you write text. And definitely encourage high contrast designs. Here's one that oftentimes gets overlooked. Sometimes people don't like, you know, for various reasons because of, you know, eye sensitivity, they can't stare at a screen all day long. They actually want to print the pages. Here's a great, great test. Take your page. Take something about your page, something about your walkthrough. Capture that, capture that screen and try printing it. Try printing out the full workflow. See if you can do it so that you can explain it to somebody without you having to go in and doctor it later. If you have to go in and doctor it later, you've probably identified some areas that you And simple interfaces are usable interfaces. Do not make navigation and discovery more difficult than is necessary. I showed you a number of tools that you can use. I also mentioned that you can do a, you can do a fair amount of automation when it comes to doing accessibility work. There are guidelines, like for example, the, the, the WCAG guidelines are the international standardized, here's all the stuff for accessibility and making things accessible. And if you use these tags, and if you use this format, and if you put them in this order, can you automate that? You absolutely can, to a degree. You can determine that something meets a requirement. You can determine that something in the WCAG checklist matches. Can I determine that this color and this color placed next to each other gives us a three to one contrast ratio? Yes, that is something that a computer can absolutely do. Can a computer decide that Zachary can actually read it and make sense of it, and that he likes that combination? No. So tools can't make judgment calls. They can confirm presence, but they can't confirm a comparable experience, and they cannot determine if it's appropriate for a situation or a context, because every user is different. And that's why, frankly, if you do accessibility work, if you do inclusive design work, if you do usability work, if you do human metrics or interactions, it's a good bet that you as a human being will be employed for a very, very, very long time. As of now. I'm sure at some point we can all be broken down into algorithms and the singularity will get here and be completely out of jobs. But I don't anticipate that happening anytime soon. And I especially don't anticipate that happening if you're focusing on those areas, especially usability, accessibility. So, farther along the product gets in development, the more difficult it is to make modifications to its design. Get in there early, because product development and early product development can make usable products for everybody, and inclusive design will make last mod mile modifications for accessibility much easier. And if nothing else, if none of this actually like resonates with you and you're walking out here going, yeah, yeah, boring, dumb, same thing, I'll just say, think of yourself in the future. With the possibility that you may have a or many disabilities that will be part of your everyday experience. The person you are designing for, the person you are testing for, is yourself when you get right now. Practice empathy. Use these design factors to help you develop your products. Have these conversations early so that it's not so difficult. It's really hard to shoehorn in accessibility after that. It's much easier to do it from the start. And the person that you will most possibly benefit from your design decisions may very well be yourself. How are we doing? Cool. Got 
four minutes. All right, fantastic. So I have a list of references here, and uh, also I strongly encourage you, if you want to get to know more about this, hashtag A11Y is commonly used. That's accessibility because it's in 11 letters, A through Y and all in between. It also means that you're an ally for accessibility. It's easy to remember. So strongly encourage, if you want to just follow that hashtag, you can meet a lot of amazing people who talk about it and who share great information, great tools, great practices. And there's also a lot of events that go on around the country and around the world focused on accessibility and inclusive design. And I encourage you to take part in it. Yes. Have I scared you all to death there? Yes. Yes. Yes, I will do so, and if for some reason I can't, I will make sure to put in something so that you, I can tell you where to get it. I usually put all my stuff up in SlideShare, so, but yes, I will certainly do so. Yes. There are a variety of tools that are available for them. They are more specialized. Usually they cost, um, but there are companies that do help develop those. Um, that was not the focus for this talk, to be honest. So I, right off the top of my head, I do know there is a company in San Francisco called Lighthouse Industries. And they specialize in doing software testing with a, like many of their users specifically are users with disabilities and that's, and they're employed by Lighthouse Industries for that specific purpose. They have a pretty good list, so I would recommend checking it out. Going once, going twice. Hey, you get a couple minutes. Thank you.